Hello and welcome to another episode of the Clinical Pharmacist podcast. My name is Rohina and I am the Head of Clinical Development at the Clinical Pharmacist Solutions. I am a lead independent prescribing pharmacist and have been working in general practice for over seven years. Today we are continuing with our clinical series where we focus on one clinical episode each week. Today's episode will be on depression. I'm joined by GP Dr. Mark Kay who has a specialist interest in mental health. Welcome Mark, thank you for joining us today. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I've been a doctor in the NHS since 2005. I've been a GP since 2011 and I've joined my current role eight years ago as a GP partner. As part of my uh, training, I did work uh, in community psychiatry and just broadly speaking, uh, psychiatry is a massive part of what we do in primary care. I mean, I've, I've had a normal surgery this morning and I would say probably half the consultations involved psychiatry either as the main issue or an issue that was mentioned or came up. So it's a big, big part of what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I've been lucky and fortunate enough to work alongside Mark where Mark has actually been able to work with pharmacists in his team, so has a great insight into how pharmacists will be doing their long-term chronic conditions and what kind of work we're involved in. So it's really great to be able to get your insight on that, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. We've enjoyed being colleagues together in, in the past, and we've definitely worked on mental health issues together. So for those listeners that are just joining us today. So we all know depression is a common mental health disorder. So I think as pharmacists, as clinicians, we are all now quite involved in the management of mental health conditions. And just being able to have the insight from you, Mark, today will be really great in advising our team and advising pharmacists on how they can get involved and be the most benefit to our patients. Yeah, thank you for having me. Perfect. So as pharmacists are getting more and more involved in depression reviews, we normally see us doing the follow up after the diagnosis has been made by the initial GP or mental health specialist that has seen the patient. How would you advise a pharmacist the best way to structure these consultations? It's a difficult one to structure, I have to say, because talking about mental health is one of the most human to human interactions, really, that I would say you have in healthcare. And I think that's very important at the start of the consultation. A rapport and trust is established because essentially, you know, you might be talking about what for us is a 10 minute appointment in which you've not only got to effectively manage what's going on, but you've, you've got to enlist the trust of the person that you're talking to really in seconds that sort of no more than minute. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get those sort of more practical aspects, that sort of safety, risk, all this sort of thing sorted. So yeah, I think communication skills at the ready. I find personally that quite a soft sort of a less brusque sort of uh, sharp and professional start is, is quite good. Just ask how someone's been feeling, you know, is, is always best done, I, I think, in a softer approach. In terms of structure, I, I would say free free flow you know you will have invariably someone who has a lot to say in gp when we're training we talk about the golden minute where the you typically a patient will talk for one minute at the start of the consultation and then you cut in but often in in sort of uh, mental health consultations or, or talking about depression it's going to be longer than a minute and you've got to allow the patient to dictate a lot of what's going on if it sounds too formulaic it essentially is going to sound like a list of, of questions that you're asking them. And again, that sort of uh, dehumanizes the contact that you're having with them. It's also worth bearing in mind that particularly, and I'm sure we're going to talk about risk a lot, but when you're talking about risk of, of self-harm and suicide, we as clinicians, essentially almost every contact, unless you know a patient well, or, or it's been sort of safely established already, you're going to be asking these questions, but from the patient's perspective, they're going to hear this question every single time they're in touch with a clinician. So it's, it is going to be a super sensitive thing to sort of broach with them. But again, it's one of the most important things you need to know as a clinician is how, how safe is this person and how comfortable you are with the conclusion of the consultation that this person is going to be safe in terms of life and limb and personal injury. Is the person going to be safe until your next contact? But establishing it in a way that's not going to break that trust or make it seem like you're just asking a list of questions. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that leads to two quite important questions, actually. So the first one would be we've discussed, actually, it's quite a sensitive topic and some people might not feel as comfortable divulging that information, especially when they've had their name GP that they've spoken to for 10 years and they've, they've come through to a pharmacist now. How would you suggest that as pharmacists, we approach that topic sensitively and just helping to build that rapport for patients to be able to openly kind of discuss their mental health? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a totally fair point to acknowledge that most clinical pharmacists that I, I know, all, all clinical pharmacists that I've worked with have at some point or another met with resistance, you know, why why am I not speaking to Dr. K, you know, uh, it be, being the sort of thought behind it, what exactly is a, a clinical pharmacist, you know, but where do they fit into things, what's this consultation all about? So, they, you know, there are going to be question marks because obviously you guys are getting established as a member of the primary care team. And to many of us, you know, to me, it's, you know, we're many years into this, but to a patient, they might not know, they might not have that level of understanding. So I think explaining your role very quickly is going to be very useful and might sort of allay any anxiety that the the patient might have that they're not speaking to their doctor or, or someone else that they're expecting to speak to. And so just, just laying out exactly who you are, what your role is. And what you're hoping to achieve from the consultation is good. In terms of, I mean, I know I've said sort of go gently with the questions about uh, self-harm, etc. But essentially, you'd, you've got to get the question out. And it, it needs to be sort of in a clear way. And I'll give you an example because I frequently come across this in e-consults where because of the sort of heavily structured e-consult, they would have ticked. Yes, for example, to I've considered hurting myself in the past week. They would frequently mention the term suicidal, for example. And part of the role of the consultation is, is to qualify exactly what they mean. Because I would say very, very frequently these strong terms are used in an e-consult or sort of a message that that's relayed to you. But when you in fact speak to the patient, it might be that, for example, they've had thoughts that they're better off not there or they wish they weren't there in their body, things along those lines, which in terms of, of risk are obviously far less than active suicidal ideation, active suicidal thoughts. You just got to ask the question, essentially, you know, say a lot, a lot of people in your position might have thoughts of harming themselves in some ways. There's something that that's ever occurred to you. That's, a, I think, quite a gentle and uh, relaxed way of doing it, which would get you enough of an answer maybe to reassure yourself or to rather manage manage the patient appropriately. I suppose the two other the same thing in a way. If, if it's someone... That, that you feel that rapport is a bit maybe not quite there, maybe the the patient still appears a bit sort of, sort of edgy. You can say, this is a question that I ask everyone that will present with symptoms like yours. And then that makes it a lot broader and, and it perhaps will make the patient feel less like that you're, you're thinking directly that they're having plans to harm themselves and more that this is just part of your job, it's part of your role. But yeah, again, I'd, I'd repeat that a lot of these patients, if it, unless they're very newly into the sort of mental health side of things, will have been asked this question. They will be expecting this question. And, you know, to tread gently is going to be the main way of doing it. Again, so it doesn't seem overstructured and so it doesn't seem like you're checking things off of off a list although to a degree it is some um, the most important uh, main thing you do need to check off the list but you know I, again it needs to be in a human way no i completely agree and i think from doing these consultations ourselves i think that's a really useful tip i think it's always really really hard to ask and express those kind of questions to patients because i think as a clinician you worry about what the response would be. I remember when I was first doing depression consultations, I always used to find it really difficult to say, have you had any suicidal thoughts or have you had any thoughts of self-harm? And I think as you start to do more and more consultations and you build up that experience, then you find the right wording that you can have to kind of ask these questions. But it is the most important question. And you do find actually... I've had some patients come back to me and say, no, thank you for asking. 
because we want to make sure they're safe. And I think they also want to make sure someone knows that they're safe as well. I think that's a really good point, actually. And that's absolutely the other side of the coin of what I was saying, rather than feeling it's a sort of persecutory or sort of inquisition type type thing, more that you're caring about that, which is what we're trying to do. Absolutely. So when we're doing these consultations, Mark, what are the red flags that pharmacists need to look out for? What should prompt the pharmacist to refer a patient to a GP whilst they're doing one of these consultations? Yeah, I mean, this is the million dollar question, really, because in primary care, the whole thing about every single consultation, be it mental health or anything else, is being comfortable with risk because often you're going to be their only contact about that particular thing that day, that week, that month or ever, you know, depending what the issue is. So you've got to be sure that the risk side of things is okay. I mean, it's different, for example, when there's say a child, a febrile child has been brought to me, something like that, where you're really sort of analyzing what's going on and it put, putting lots of information together to come to a conclusion. I think it's, it's a more clear cut thing in, in mental health risk because the answer usually says it all. It's more, more often than not, it's a no, you know, not something that happens all the time at all that you're, you're faced with someone who's saying, well, yeah, I think there's a real chance that I'm going to, I'm going to harm myself. But I would say the threshold comes really if a, you're not getting a clear answer to the question. For example, I don't want to discuss that, something like that. Then you're not, you're left unsure. You know, you can't document this is, this is a low risk situation. Or if they disclose to you that they are considering harming themselves and that that's obviously going to sort of raise alarm bells. There's going to be sort of more nuanced situations, I think, where people, for example, would, uh, you've identified that they've got quite a poor support network, they're quite isolated, they're quite despairing. These are sort of subtle situations where they're not overtly saying that they're thinking of harming themselves, but you're thinking, you know, their situation appears quite bleak and you'd want to sort of explore it a bit further. I've recently had contact with patients who've said things along the lines of, I've stopped telling clinicians because they don't only call an ambulance anyway, you know, so I'm not going to tell you if I'm thinking about harming myself. And you feel, uh, obviously at that point, you feel concerned for the patient, but you know, you also, again, left not really with a clear idea about what they're intending to do. There's a big caveat to all of this, and that is that whether or not you, you share it with a GP, and even when you do share it with a GP, if someone's intending to do something they're not always going to share it with you and if someone has shared something with you and you've done sort of everything you can to sort of support them and avoid it it can still happen you know and we're clinicians we have sort of encounters with with patients that can be sort of relatively brief be it 10 minutes 20 minutes but they've got the rest of the 24 hours of the day and the seven days a week to live. And we can't obviously monitor them for all of that time. The feelings fluctuate, moods fluctuate. So there's always going to be that degree of uncertainty. And often it's it's a question of making a call, you know, at the very extreme in out of hours, when I've been de dealing with uh, out of hours calls and doing out of hours visits. Um, you know, you can speak to a patient who's saying at the very extreme, I've, I've got a knife with me. I'm about to do something, you know, I'm about to cut myself. That obviously, that's not something that comes into primary care, but obviously that's something that needs very, very immediate action. You know, the police would have needed to be involved. The ambulance needs to be called. It's all a very sort of coordinated effort, but we would tend to deal with the more subtle, with the more nuanced. Um, but yeah, taking it back to your main question, Rather than, say, bringing it to a GP for advice, I would sort of rephrase it as making a shared management decision because obviously you, as the pharmacist, you've had that contact with the patient. You've been the one who's got that rapport. You've heard the very words as they've been said. You have that sense of meaning. So it's, it's a shared management plan that's very useful. And I do it even after all this time as a GP. If I'm not sure about a, a level of risk, 
I will bring in a colleague, you know, they wouldn't have to be a partner, they could be any colleague, a salary doctor, certainly an experienced clinical pharmacist, and look at the situation and look at sort of what would need to be done. So yeah, I, I think there isn't there isn't a clear answer. And I suppose that's why I'm I'm giving such a such a sort of long answer. It's when that risk, when you can't reassure yourself that there is no risk or there's a very low risk of something happening that would be a good point i think to bring it to the attention of gp and discuss sort of next steps absolutely and i think having that shared care as well that's something that you mentioned is something that's really important so being able to kind of have a multidisciplinary approach to it if you're not sure being able to ask your colleagues being able to kind of stratify that risk to find out what the actual risk is to that patient and just having a thorough look at their history is this something that's been going on for a long time having a look at their notes seeing what care that they're under at the moment and then coming up with a joint plan and having that discussion of what to do next for that patient I think it nicely takes me on to the next question as well so what kind of safety netting advice would you be giving to these patients that are having these consultations yeah, I mean, it's the key question really is about safety netting because once you've sort of uh, decided that consultation can safely be terminated, you've got to leave the patient really feeling that they've got a lifeline should things get worse. Again, it comes with experience, but it's usually going to be fairly clear if this is someone who you're concerned they might deteriorate, they might get worse, or they might get to the point of, of self-harm. I mean, what would make you think that may be a history certainly of self-harm or someone who said I've considered self-harm but I'm not planning or intending or anything but you know so it's raising that sort of risk with you but not leaving you with the sense that they're going to do anything so essentially you need to leave yourself open when when you're available for them to be able to contact you again i say to them whenever we're, we're during surgery opening hours you know just ask for dr k or ask for the duty doctor at times that i'm not there you know out of hours you've got 111 and it's crucial i think that people know about the liaison psychiatry that works out as a and e that 24 hours a day there is a psychiatry service that can be seen in A&E. Now, the thought of sitting in A&E when you're feeling like this, I think, can be very off-putting for a patient. But for us, it's often going to be the safest approach. And for them, it's going to be the safest approach because there isn't really another way of seeing a psychiatrist or a psychiatry team with a few hours notice, essentially. Most referrals that you're going to make on an outpatient basis within the NHS to a mental health team is going to be quite a while so if you think there's an immediate risk then these are the things to say is really contact you again as a first port of call use the 111 service if it's if it's out of hours and they're feeling like they're deteriorating or if it's sort of a crisis point or dire straits you know as i would sometimes say to the patient then a and e as an option if the patient's known to mental health services, they will usually have outpatient letters with a list of all the, the crisis information available, the numbers, etc. And you will have that available in, in your document system for them. So you can tell them, you know, that look, if you look at this most recent letter that you've had, you've got the number for at the local mental health service crisis line open 24 hours a day usually. And then, you know, you, you've covered almost every base in terms of safety netting. The other, and it's not strictly safety netting, but I suppose it's more follow-up, but it's, it's extremely vital, is, you know, for you to organize a proactive follow-up within a time scale that you feel is appropriate. So if you're doing a, a depression review on someone who's been well-established on, on citalopram and they're doing final net, they were last spoken to two months prior, their, their mood is stable, there's no risk, you're not going to be thinking about giving them a call in a week to see how they are, you know, you, you're going to be thinking about maybe a month or two, putting that medication on repeat, now, that sort of decision. But if it's someone who has sort of had a recent deterioration in mood, certainly someone that you're starting on medication, then the follow-up is going to be a lot sooner. And again, you raised the point, you know, the, the sensation that you want to create, that the patient is being looked after, that we're being vigilant, that we're being caring offering a phone call in a week 
often sounds very comforting to a patient. They feel like that there's that structural gambling. And also something that when self-harm has been brought up as an issue, you can actually say quite plainly, will, will you be safe until then? Do you feel that you wouldn't do anything to harm yourself if I call you in a week? And, and they can say yes. And then again, you can feel that you've done your best for them. You can document again, sort of in the name of safe practice. And to make it clear that the discussion has taken place because documentation is actually clinically a very important part, obviously, of mental health care for several reasons. So you can remind yourself or, or the next person can get a full idea of what's going on if, if it happened to not be you. So you don't, they don't have to go through a lot of details again. But also you've got to make it clear in the patient's records that these questions have been asked and that you've done due diligence as a clinician. And that can sound a bit, I don't want to say defensive, but overstructured, you could say, but it's an important part of what's going on to document what exactly what's been said and where reassurance has been sought. Yeah, so I think absolutely, um, just echoing what you said there, Mark. So I think the safety netting advice of NHS 111, A&E if needed, and where they can get back in contact with you at the practice as and when they need an appointment. Just, I think there's some really useful key phrases that you gave us there in terms of how to structure it to a patient, the good wording to use where we do get stuck there. I think it's also important, as you mentioned, documentation is key. So if you're safety netting, if you're checking those red flags, just making sure that they're all documented in the patient notes. There's also other multiple sources of information, support, self-help materials, support groups that are quite useful as well to our patients, things like Mind, Depression UK, Sane Line, the Samaritans as well. So just making sure that the patients all have access to those as well. Finding out a little bit more about what their support system is, who have they got around them, are they living alone, what's their current risk to them, do they have someone they can talk to when they're feeling lower, so all of these things, in addition, we should be adding to our documentation as well, just to make sure that we are making sure we're looking after that patient. The follow up, if it's not you as the next clinician that's seeing them, there's a thorough history for someone to review the notes before taking over the care of that patient. So thank you, Mark. I think that was some really, really like important and valuable information for our listeners. Thank you. Just a final couple questions, Mark. So we're now in a time post-COVID where we saw a big rise in mental health conditions, as well as being in a time of inflation, higher cost of living, social media society, which is impacting everyone in terms of image, finance, keeping up with the Joneses, etc. Unfortunately, as clinicians, we've seen in our consultation, there are quite a big rise in number of patients that are dealing with mental health problems. Personally, for myself as a pharmacist, what I find more difficult is where I see teens and young children suffering with depression and the help that I can give them to guide them through the consultation. How do you generally deal with these patients? Do you have any advice to the pharmacists that are dealing with these consultations? Yeah, I mean, it's super hard and for anyone, but me personally, as a dad, it, it's very heartbreaking at times because a lot of what the kids or, or the young people have to go through does relate to bullying is, is an issue. Online bullying does often come up. I think a big, big issue is expectations, academic expectations of schools, because we, we, we all came up doing exams and we all know that actually you're introduced to this idea of exams, revising anxiety at such a young age. And that does really feed into someone who maybe would have a predisposition for whatever reason to anxiety. So sort of academic sort of expectations, it comes into it as well. I think COVID, we've all done COVID. We've all been through it. We've all had our experience. And I think most people's experience has been overwhelmingly negative, obviously, for a variety of, of reasons. And I think with children, it's no different. You know, homeschooling was no joke, I can tell you completely, because, you know, having 
having done it myself and juggled that that with work but the children didn't get to see each other very much you know a lot of the time they've gone through a seismic change in their life that you would never expect to have to happen and really there isn't anything else in really living memory that has been such a change over such a long period of time you're thinking back and you're thinking well what is comparable you know the change of life that people had to have in world war ii for example that sort of level of change in their lifestyle so you've got people coming out of this their parents have been affected they themselves are being affected so yeah covid is a big uh, big factor but move, moving sort of back on the subject it's more important than ever with younger people to bring in that human aspect of you and to uh, to actually dig deep you know and to be yourself in the consultation find that empathy not empathy that you're demonstrating in the exam but your genuine human empathy because you'll be feeling it you know these are potentially difficult consultations it can be hard to gain the trust of a teenager okay as an adult we all remember being teenagers uh, and there are certain times in our teens when for most of us i don't know if this counts for you really no but for me definitely i felt that i knew everything and knew more than the adult the adult is someone who couldn't possibly understand what i was going through and I think just breaking down that barrier. But again, there's, there, there's only so far that you, that you can go. You're the professional, they're the patient, you're older than them, they're young people. The one crucial difference that you're often going to have with young people is in terms of sort of protective factors, chances are they live with their parents and the parents may well have sort of raised the alarm themselves you know so you've got this sort of support that's very very automatic you're not going to encounter a 10 year old or a 13 year old that is entirely socially isolated or living on their own as you would an older person so involvement of the parents is very important it can get more difficult when the child is 16 17 where they're phrase competent where they're consulting sort of without an adult present that can be very tricky because confidence and confidentiality still applies. The only real time, you know, in this sort of situation where it could be breached is where there was sort of a genuine risk to the patient. And again, that's not a common situation. That's a very, very rare situation. So again, is report. It's finding that human side in you and making it not look like a list of sort of checkpoints that you're doing, even though to a degree that's what we're doing internally, making sure we've done everything that we're supposed to to look after this young person. It's a question of phrasing it all and making it all into a sort of conversational style and... The other thing that I find that young people appreciate, even, you know, your preteen sort of ages, is the feeling that they're not being patronized, the feeling that they're not being spoken down to, that you're not oversimplifying the language, that you're not oversimplifying the situation, because that is an immediate turn off for most young people. That's uh, where they would end up with feeling maybe that they weren't being listened to or weren't being understood. So I think trying to find a suitable level to connect with this young person is very important. And again, it comes with experience. It comes with practice. It's not really something that is teachable, you know, in, in one session, but equally we've all got it in us as, you know, in our more sort of human side. And sometimes you've got to use that. No, absolutely. And I think as clinicians, it can be difficult for us to actually have some of those consultations and not even just the children, even adults going through these kind of scenarios and dealing with these situations. So just helping to be that person or have an open rapport with them, whether they can approach their GP or their pharmacist to discuss these, I think is a really good outlet for them and just making sure that they're aware of what support is available to them. So thank you, Mark. That was really useful. So final question for you, Mark. Do you have any other top tips for pharmacists that are conducting any depression or mental health reviews? Any final words of wisdom? Yeah, I think safety is number one. Uh, safety and risk, that's the number one sort of priority that you need to go away with this feeling that nothing is going to happen to harm this patient or if it did it couldn't have been foreseen by what happened in the consultation uh, so that's number one 
Number two, I just think shared management is so, so important. You know, if you're worried about a situation, if it's a, a little bit subtle and you're not quite sure what to do, bring someone else in, bring a GP in, bring, bring them in and discuss it and come to the decision together. And that's done at absolutely every level of every single speciality, whatever topic it is. Um, but it comes particularly important with these uh, type of consultations. And I would say that if you're anything like me, then sort of mental health related consultations are the ones you sometimes take away with you a little bit. You know, you're touched by it, you're a little bit worried about it maybe, but these are the ones that sometimes stick with you. It brings out the, the sort of vulnerable human side in you. And that's okay. And that's okay for it to show in the consultation because it helps the patient understand that they're not talking to an AI, you know, they're not filling in a form. They're speaking to a person that cares about what's going on and that, that has an interest, certainly a professional and clinical interest in what's going on with the mental health. I think that's really useful. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. I think your insights today will be valuable to a lot of pharmacists that are taking these consultations, whether it be for the as they're starting out in their early parts of the career or whether they are already working in general practice for a long period of time or they're looking to join general practice. I think it's really important when we are doing these consultations, they can be hard on our mental health as well. So it's really important to look after your own mental health as well. So those sorts of mindful apps such as Headspace, Calm, that they're all really great for sources of information. For those pharmacists that are also joining us, wanting to know a little bit more about depression and how they can structure their consultations, if you head over to cpaweb.org.uk, we do have our depression training, which is part of our CMR series, which will help you to look at the information gathering stage how to carry out a consultation, the red flags, the safety netting, side effects of the medication that you'll be prescribing, and how to generally guide the patient through the consultation and through the process. So again, thank you, Mark, for joining us today. And thank you for those that are listening. Thanks for having me.